it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out to be on the show today. I appreciate it. You got quite a background. Yes, so, thank you for that, Joe. I appreciate that. And please. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a quite there was a little bit of a delay. Where are you coming out of? Uh, right now, I'm at a Longmont, Colorado, just out north of Boulder. Oh man, Colorado, so so good looking. What a great place. It is. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So before we get into your very busy existence, I want to know, you know, COVID threw everybody into a tailspin, did its own thing on all of us. How did you survive COVID and how has it changed the way that you do things now? Wow, that's a deep one. So, yeah. I mean, to set the stage for your question in brief, I was a corporate guy for 23 years and I brought in a quarter billion dollars direct contribution to two Fortune 100. And then I decided after what happened at Mandalay Bay with the massacre that I would get on bended knee to my wife right here in this living room and ask for a creative venture to film with Live Nation. And we did partner with Live Nation to film on top of Mandalay Bay within yards of where Stephen Paddock literally murdered over 50 American souls. As it turns out, uh, I decided to exit out of a corporate life to continue carrying that mission while I was moonlighting, building that content for my brand, Sonic Octane. And so to your question, COVID came along and I had multiple businesses supporting that brand, which was basically a performing act. So I owned a separate bus company, incidentally, and I also a company that supported the brand. And when COVID hit, literally it was several hundred thousand dollars that were invested behind that effort collectively with all of those businesses. And I was leveraged. And it literally hit the wall. So how did I survive? I think a lot of prayer, <laughs> uh, a little bit of the, uh, what was the Federal CARES Act that, that allowed some of the creative funds uh, in the form of grants or loans to trickle down into small businesses. And I did not go for a paycheck protection program loan. It just didn't seem to me to be entirely necessary. Although I knew a lot of colleagues that were entrepreneurs that were cashing in. And over time, I found my way out of it. And it was private hire situations, largely with my bus company, coupled with 30 million song plays on Amazon Prime Video that led us there. Wow. So let's get to the heart and soul of what you do. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders at a career day. Sure. One, of the kids, one of the kids looks up and says, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? Oh, that's a very good question. My name is Robbie Phoenix. And I've worked in Fortune 100 companies teaching them how to compete and win against their competition. I've brought in a quarter billion dollars in leveraging my creative advantage for my competitive advantage. And I did the same in the music industry, earning 30 million song plays on Amazon Prime Video in our first debut sync deal with a film independent filmmaker and submitted for a daytime Emmy Award consideration. So I leverage and I teach companies how to leverage their creative advantage for their competitive advantage. That's my short version. What was it that you wanted to be when you were in the third grade? What was your dream? You know, I used to trace a lot of Peanuts characters and it, I used to also act a lot in my basement. So like for me, it was always a natural extension to either get into a realm that was public domain for speaking or performing. I think there was also a rather creative side of me that was never entirely expressed. And it was, it was interesting orthodoxy to spend 23 years in a corporate life to figure out and unlock how do you get to be creative in a, a, a very sterile, you know, potentially work environments like, you know, big companies, you know, had to figure that one out. So let's go back in your lineage. Let's find out how you got to where you're at now. Tell me about where you were born and raised and what were the seeds that were put into you to be so highly driven and to allow others to succeed? Sure. I mean, I, I think to start with, you know, my, my driving factor number one is, and it says on my Facebook page, you know, Robbie Phoenix or Robert Zias, my formal birth name, you know, there's nothing like working from your heart and making a difference in the world. So if you start from that just seed of who I am, you know, I, I do my best. I'm not perfect, but I absolutely do my best to go to God with things and ask the questions, am I doing things for the right reasons and the right ways? Uh, am I going to be allowed to honor and serve a purposeful life? And you know what I found for many years is I was cashing myself out. And there are probably a lot in your audience that can relate to this, where you've got people that simply go into scenarios where 
you know, they've got a certain potential, but they resign themselves to the job. And I'm not talking down to employers or jobs. They're very necessary in, in a free economy. But at the end of the day, they can be limiting either on ourselves or because of the, the, the nature of the work itself. And we're not always giving our full potential. So when I was in corporate America and I started as a top salesperson nationwide, oddly enough, broke as I started, I had a team of 15 people around me that helped me be successful in that role. And ultimately I started asking myself, is this really my potential? Like I've been a top sales guy nationwide for a couple of years now, and it didn't seem to really resonate. So I went into technical world and I tried that for five years and I got promoted to the top rank nationally there. And I was asking myself the same thing. I'm like, okay, I know how to sell. I know how to design technical solutions that are custom and walk the clients through the, the use cases and under in design, uh, all these things. And maybe there's something else in my calling. And sure enough, by God's grace, I stumbled into it. I tripped into it. It wasn't like I had some great brainiac roadmap that started my career. And that led to me towards competitive research and ultimately competitive intelligence work. So I always say, like, you know, if you really want to achieve your potential and what drives Robbie Phoenix, me personally, you have to really step back and be humble to learn. You've got to learn from many others. You've got to learn in a in a flexible way. You've got to uh, receive not just mentoring, but on the job training. You've got to also go to God or, or whoever your higher authority is there, hopefully a benevolent one. And you're asking yourself, is this really my calling? And I, I think for 23 years, I leveraged that creative advantage to my advantage to bring in the quarter billion dollars. That's very true. It's all documented stuff. However, I still felt even in the corporate construct, there were limiting factors that led me back into the entertainment world and into music that where my passion sat. And sure enough, again, being creative and looking to filmmakers, rather than going to Spotify and selling my soul to Satan, let's say, not saying that Spotify is Satan, but for a royalty to an artist that's independent, that's kind of like not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, that's very productive to your income. And so I ultimately went to a filmmaker and I leveraged that creative advantage again. And I said, you know, there are other ways of structuring and packaging your product, your music, in a way that gets better exposure, in a way that gives you even a daytime Emmy submission, which was pretty awesome. And that led to greater things with Live Nation, ultimately to film. What was the project that you were on where you felt like you arrived, where you were getting recognized for your talents? It was a successful campaign. When did that moment happen for you? You know, I really felt at the apex of the project was Sonic Octane, and that's the name of my creative effort. It's a band that is, in fact, a brand. So I have many artists that participate under that brand and contribute in various ways. At the end of the day, when we film with Live Nation, you know, we're filming in multiple HD cameras with a film crew and, and acting staff of 18 people going up and down Las Vegas Boulevard, filming at the top of the foundation room, which is an exclusive VIP only member only location. You had to have advanced filming permission within Las Vegas. And literally, this is like, to me, the apex of the work, because at that point, that was our third filming, independent filming. And you get to a point where you really can realize there's a lot of good that you can do in the world teaming with big brands like Live Nation. They're huge. They're a multi-billion dollar company. Why are they bothering with a small independent artist out of Colorado, right? So that was a big deal for us. And I think the second part for me that validated was when we were getting on national TV and getting a little bit of exposure on, you know, 7.1 million audience per interview, like that kind of thing. It really scaled and seemed to make a lot of sense to me. So in your pursuits in life, who's been kind of a role model or a hero for you? Hmm. Whew. Well, it depends which vector of hero you mean. <laughs> I mean, musical hero? I mean, just at a general level, I could never touch the talent of Prince, uh, but I would absolutely put him in as an authority that was inspired divinely and had a presence and had charisma and had talent multiple layers of talent that was just incredible composition talent production talent performance talent uh more directly excuse me in my sphere i would say as a guitarist which i am in sonic octane you know i tend to gravitate towards alex lifeson of rush dean yeah. DeLeo of stp 
you know, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, those are the ones I gravitate a little more towards for various reasons, either tone, uh, technique, or just, you know, incredible composition ability and songwriting ability and collaboration within that, within their, their own, you know, band efforts. I think from a business layer, I'd probably put, uh, you know, there are a couple of people that come top of mind, like Larry Miller. He was an entrepreneur that was based out of Salt Lake City. And he, to me, was inspiring and He, you know, heavy touch, but not a controlling whatsoever kind of way. Uh, you know, he, he inspired me to, in, in terms of being an entrepreneur and just staying focused on the mission and, and being dedicated every single day, working long hours. I think on a personal level, I would probably put my friend Richie Vernon out of Boston because he struggled uh, for a number of years, including in Indiana, a couple of years there where he was in dead winters, homeless, and literally could have just died on the street. And now he lives in Boston, and this is after many years now. To his credit, you know, he lived in a halfway house, eventually was employed there, now is independent living. And, you know, th th these are life stories that don't turn around very easily. And I've seen that in life a few times as well with others. So I think that it, when you think of leader, I think of leaders, you know, in different vectors again, in different paths. I have other business leaders, obviously, in the Fortune 100 companies that I served, I could mention as well. So... You know, being in the realm of music and admiring, like as you mentioned, guitarists and other people, if you could meet one of these musicians that you haven't met yet, have a conversation with them, who would it be? Oh, I mean, to me personally, okay, it's just my little flavor of this. Absolutely, Dean DeLeo of Stone Temple Pilots. I mean, the guy's composition, his choice of cording, his tone, his presence, to me at least, on a stage. The mystique of that, but the, the the grandeur of his tone, I've been chasing it for years. I, I own a bulk of his equipment now in my studio, wow. having deconstructed the tone to understand. You know, it's almost like when you're a drummer, you have to learn paradiddles and go stroking, and you got to figure out what fits for you and your sound. It's the same thing as a guitarist. So I chased his tone. I chased Alex Lifeson's tone from Rush. I would probably put Dean at the top of the list and Alex just barely behind him, uh, you know, to me. I met other many other celebrities, incidentally, but those are the two I would love to meet. <laughs> right on, man. So of all of the acts that are out there, I was thinking about this, or maybe I heard it on a show. You know, arena rock is something that's very rare anymore, like in that classic sense, like the Foo Fighters or whatever. Who's the most important, or who do you view as one of the best run, like, outfits right now that's touring that's entertaining people on a regular basis that you're impressed with well it depends on how you want to be impressed like you know there's the grandeur of taylor swift yeah and and the sparkle and and katie perry in that genre uh there's the nine inch nails and it's red rock every time they'll sell out multiple nights and it's a different genre and it's a, obviously a noir aesthetic that's very grunge yeah. and heavy and, and potentially dark and introspective. There's obviously bands like Royal Bliss that are independent, largely based out of Salt Lake, and, and they tour constantly and they're building audience and they've been really building that audience post COVID quite well. I've been watching and appreciating Neil Middleton's leadership in that. Incidentally, he's a, he's a contact that I feel very friendly to. Uh, and then you look at bands that are perennials, like Enough's Enough. I was just a couple of weeks ago with Chip uh, the lead vocalist for Enough's Enough in Vegas, they were performing at Vant. And I was also there supporting a very, very close friend of mine, Steve Berez from the band Venray out of LA. They're now based out of Vegas. And I just go to that and I go, you know, there's a lot of bands you could admire for different reasons. Again, you have to really deconstruct why you're admiring them and what that's all about. Um, I think on the very high end of the touring circuit in the rock genre, I, I would have put Van Halen posthumously, although not with the reformed, uh, you know, David Lee Ross situation. I just yeah. think that was a little bit uh, needed some pre-production diligence. I would put Guns N' Roses at the top of that pantheon today. Yeah, um, I would probably put Metallica in that same mix. They're, they're, yeah. They execute very well on stage and they're pros all the way. Yeah, um, that'd be top of mind. So let let's get a little bit more fantastical here. Let's say you get into. Um, 
a, a time machine and you could go see any show in the history of music, be in the crowd. Who are you going to go see? What are you going to see? Oh, my God. I mean, honest to God, I would see every single performance of Randy Rhodes for sure. Like maybe one or two when he was still with Quiet Riot, but every single show with Ozzy for sure. I mean, hands down, the most talented guitarist that may have ever lived, uh, in my humble opinion. I, I think the second that would come to mind would have to be like Led Zeppelin at Nebworth Festival. Uh, and maybe even like Jimmy Page, Robert Planet, you know, live. What was it called? Live. Live Aid, yes, yeah. in the eighties. That would be another one I would absolutely love to see, and I would have flown to see them between continents, candidly, if I had that opportunity, yeah. and to see them at the O2 concert as well when they reunified with Jason Bonham. Yeah, those are top of mind. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're obviously a very highly driven individual. What is it that motivates you? Every day you wake up, you have things that you want to do and live through. What what gets you through it? I think the very first thing is humble before God. In my view, I mean, I'm not perfect, you know, <laughs> I am far from perfect, but I do my best every day. I, I rely on very few close friends to give me mentoring, to give me encouragement when I need it. And it's not so infrequent that I need it. And I'll say this, if it weren't for that, for God factor and for my family, I don't know where I'd be. Like, honestly, what was I before being married as Robbie Phoenix? I was living in a band house running four days a week, living on literally snicker bars for, for meals, uh, hoping that, you know, my band would break in my early 20s. And as I flash forward in my life, while God called me into a, a service in Fortune 100 companies and earning a quarter billion dollars of direct contribution as a branded industry-renowned competitive intelligence expert in tech, I would say there was still another calling and I don't know, for some reason, God allowed me even in the middle of my life here into my forties to go, Hey man, you're basically going to take a massive financial nosedive to get into music. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll just call it like it is right. Like yeah. what's the multiple for a band and in their earnings per show that's in the mid market, even at the top end of where they're branded. Well, like our band, it's not sexy. It's not, you're not making 1.8 million per show average in Polestar because you're Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters and not picking on them, they're awesome. But the point of it is, it ain't that way, right? You've got to worry about diesel, you've got to worry about oil, you've got to worry about uh, analytic costs for your, your PR engine. You got to worry about the label and digital distribution and what's the return, if any. You got to worry about the right media exposure. And, and a lot of things go into that to entrepreneur and be successful there. So. I mean, I would say, like, I think if it's anything else, and I've had, you know, nights at three in the morning where diesel's splashing literally into my face, yeah. and it's freezing outside, and there's no heat on a bus, it's a God factor. At that point, you're really doing it for the glory of God and, and for, hopefully, a good message in your music that's, you know, your, your family and your community and, and the people that are listening can really be proud of as a legacy. So... Based on the wisdom you've gained in your life, if you were to have a dream tonight, run into the 20-year-old version of yourself, you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained in your life to this point. What would you tell that young version? <laughs> well, this is a real thing. You know, again, I'm back to my not being perfect. I think one of my biggest flaws, and I have only, I hope, a couple that most people point out and kind of question, they go, like this, and it really, it, one of one of my friends even, I mean, literally, I was crying in this kitchen like uh, last November over this very point. He goes, you know, you're so trusting and you get so close to people so quickly. And like on one hand of it, that's so true. Like when I get attached to people and I care, I care deeply. And, and I'm a loyal person to the core. And I have had friends over 40 years that know me that way. Uh, the flip side of that is, it's probably sometimes, especially in the entertainment industry, a little trust and verify uh, because it's not like a corporate structure. It's not where you have HR and senior leadership that if there's some malarkey going on or someone taking advantage somewhere or misrepresenting, conflating their ability to do value for you, you know, there are these artificial walls in corporate environments where that just simply can't exist. It's, it's in a vacuum where people will know quickly and reprimands or demotions or terminations will happen because they should. 
Uh, so I would say if I were giving myself advice in brief, I'd say trust, but verify. <laughs> Absolutely. And kind of like, you know, yeah, combine that with the hard part and you're good to go. So of all the things that you've done in your life up to this point, what are you the proudest of? Ooh, uh, without a single question, marrying my wife, Joanne. I mean, honest to God, I was so grateful that she even considered me at the time that I was in my early 20s again, and I had no degree. I had no income. <laughs> I was basically scraggling along as an artist, wannabe music, uh, musician artist, rather. And ultimately, it was like, you know, what do I really have to offer? Like, uh, she thought I was handsome. She thought I had some virtue, uh, I suppose. Uh, but looking back, I kind of go, you know, it's a wonder that she ever dated me and, and it, let alone committed deeply to marry someone. Uh, although she knew me for two years uh, and, you know, I'd volunteer and stuff like that even back then. But I, I, I really wonder is like the traditional definition of a husband. You know, we get these pictures of the white picket fence and the puppy just, you know, they adopted. It's not a child situation day one. And it's, you know, you've got like a career, you've got your advanced degree, you've got a library and a, you know, smoking jacket or whatever that is in a country club membership. I had nothing to offer her. Literally, I had no house, <laughs> I had no, no paycheck. I just knew that I had to work my ever loving ass off to be blunt, to succeed. And that's why the team around me was critical early in my career at the 15 people that I pointed to earlier they allowed me that success, right? They taught me, they mentored me, they invested in me, they believed in me, and that led somewhere, right? That, that led somewhere, and I was humbled to, to be in that at the time. So I don't know, I'd say marrying my wife and looking at the legacy of that even to date, we've got three amazing, successful, and beautiful children that have a heart just like dad, thank God. You know, the world will continue on, and my mother-in-law used to point out rightly that, you know, babies are the opinion that, God's opinion that the world should in fact go on. So I, I'm grateful for that. And I think that's where I would start my gratitude in having done the right things in my life. Yeah, that's a great quote. Um, so after all of this time, everything you've done, and all the roads you've been down, everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, fans, clients, colleagues, but you're in control. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? <laughs> I'm Robbie yeah. Phoenix, man. And this is what I'm really proud of. I've been working with a branding company out of Dallas. And so, you know, I've had the privilege of working with them and they're working closely with me now to launch and monetize the brand Robbie Phoenix. And what, what is Robbie Phoenix? Like, let me break it down for you in a nutshell and I could run up the stairs like I did with them when I first consulted with them. There were these two Robbies, right? There was the corporate Robbie that made a quarter billion that I earned about roughly 1% of that value back in my career over time. There's the... The artist Robbie that invested, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own personal savings to go into art for the fact that there was a massacre in Vegas that, hey, as Americans, as artists, we should be communicating something of value to elevate the discourse and make some positive change over time. So, you know, I would just say, like, there were these two sides. And up until maybe two months ago, I finally was consulting with this branding company, explaining my background. They're like, wait a second, you're a competitive intelligence expert in tech. Your industry recognized you've got all the credential, you've got all the awards. They spent a quarter million with you last year through a third party to consult with you around pricing for Christ's sakes. And then on the other hand, you hung out with Slash, Chester Bennington, Scott Weiland, Eddie Van Halen, and go down the list of celebrities as Robbie Phoenix. They go, bro, you're just Robbie Phoenix. Give yourself the authority to be who you are. And so I'm on a new journey now, candidly. And with everything I've just explained in this interview, I will share with your audience humbly and truly that I'm allowing myself to be who the hell I am for once in my life. And it took a long time to get there. And I'm allowing myself to really know with authority, having traveled 40,000 miles, personally driving a Prevo Class A bus all around the country, having all that sacrifice and learning along the way, then I'm an authority, but also an authentic artist now. And I'm no longer going to be concerned about, you know, is this chord played correctly or, you know, oh, gee, it's a demo versus, oh, what's commercially releasable. I'm an artist and that's who I am. And I'm proud to say that I finally have arrived as Robbie Phoenix.
Man, what a triumphant, great way to kind of encapsulate you and wrap this up a little bit. But before we get out of this proverbial digital door, where is the best place for anyone out there to go to learn more about you? Anything related to your world, where do they go? Absolutely. And the first thing, I'm doing keynote speaking and accelerator courses to teach individuals in any company how to compete to win and make their company literally millions of dollars. It took me 10 years of my career to unlatch this and figure all this out. And at the long story short, if you want to text me directly at 33777, just type in the word Robbie, R-O-B-B-I-E, the 33777. That's the first thing. You'll get into my win factor distribution list. That's the first thing. The second thing, if you want to follow the artist, Robbie, first start off with LinkedIn. Just go to LinkedIn forward slash in forward slash. Robert Zias. My last name is Zias and Zebra, E A S is in Sam. You can find me on LinkedIn. You'll see some posts out there on some of the content we've curated with Live Nation. And then you can also follow us on Twitter at Sonic Bandfan with over 21,000 followers strong there. Or Facebook, we've got over well, two to 3,000 followers there at Sonic Octane. That's the name of the brand, which is the band. Right on, man. Robbie, this has been great. Thank you for opening up. Your, your world to us. It's, it's a great story, man. I mean, I, what resonates is that how comfortable you are after all this time of figuring everything out and all of the glamour and the despair and everything's kind of come together as a self-actualized whole. It's good, man. Well, I really appreciate that. And please be looking forward to new releases with Sonic Octane. We had a punt right before COVID. It's a song called The Reckoning. And that was the effort we collaborated with Live Nation. Curtain Call Records, Rock Rage Radio, and Sony. And we'll be having more releases ahead this year. All right, man. Robbie, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Best of luck with everything. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Take care.